This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast for visiting television, sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, Ultraviolet, episodes three and four. She doesn't want to live. Not like this. Empty. You made sure of that. If there was any chance of happiness with another man, you killed it. I died to give her what she wants. She would have been so happy. You killed that, not me. Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast ripped from the headlines. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? Did you think we would be discussing vampires and pedophiles ever on the podcast? Not at the same time. (laughs) Uh, My joke was, uh, they're both a real drain on society, am I right? (laughs) <laughs> oh dear <laughs> i thought of that in the shower this morning and i was like that's gold that's gold jerry that's gold mm-hmm. all right well you've given a real tease for what's to come uh before we get there i think you've got a little something prepared for us to do i do i have a little uh quiz for you and uh i've called it test your vampire knowledge <laughs> Ooh, I like it. Yeah, it's going to be really quick. It's 10 questions. Can people play along at home? <laughs> of course they can, yeah. Grab your dice, grab your dominoes, pull up a chair, get yourself comfortable, <laughs> put the kids to bed, call the neighbors, get ready to go. Perfect. Question the first. Which of the following vampires don't have fangs? True Blood, Wizards of Waverly Place, Ultraviolet, or the 1981 novel The Hunger? Well, I don't know two of those things, so I'm going to go with The Hunger. You got it right, my friend. One for one. Yes. One out of ten. Question two. What is not, underline not, a traditional method to kill a vampire? Now, I looked over, there's been various traditions of vampires and stuff, and I kind of put them all together, but one of these is not a method to kill a vampire. It's never been used before decapitation slash stuffing the severed head's mouth with garlic okay that's real a sacred slash blessed bullet okay a stake through the chest or a cross i'm gonna go with sacred bullet because that's is that a werewolf thing unfortunately <clears throat> it's a cross a cross will burn it does not kill them oh you're right it was a trick question it was a trick question i'm sorry all right question three which literary vampire work came first the vampire by john polidori Dracula by Bram Stoker, or Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu? I hate this question for some reason. Do you? (laughs) By the way, the vampire is spelt with a Y. I want to go with the vampire, I think. You know what? You are correct. Ah, nice. 1819. Dracula came out in 1897. Hmm. People just love vampires. Here's an easy one for you to make you feel good. What was the name of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer spinoff show starring a vampire? That'd be Angel. You are correct. Question five. Which of these is not an Anne Rice vampire novel? Blood Canticle, Blood and Gold, (laughs) A Vein of Truth, Blackwood Farm. Vein of Truth. (laughs) You're right. (laughs) Is that a real book, though? No, it's not. I just came up with it. I asked Laura that, too, and she also spotted it. So I think my pun is maybe it's too on point. Maybe on too on point. You should write that book, though. A Vein of Truth. Yeah, it's great. Question six. In the Twilight series, vampires don't burn in the sun. What happens to them instead? Oh, well, they sparkle. There you go. Question seven. What is the name of the main antagonist vampire in Stephen King's Salem's Lot? Is it Kurt Barlow, Salem, Dracula, or Ben Mears? I am going to say Salem. It's not. It's Uh. Kurt Barlow. You didn't go with Dracula, huh? Dracula? I didn't even catch that when you said it the first time. (laughs) Yeah, Dracula. Wonderful. Here's a fun one. Question eight. How many people and vampires, so both, are killed on screen in From Dusk Till Dawn? So these are on-screen kills that you see as a viewer. 99, 63, 122, 395. I'm going to say, what was the first one? 100 and something? 
I'm going to go 122. You were correct again. Your guesses are great. I bet you did really well in school on guessing on uh, multiple choice, did you? Oh, I did so much guessing on multiple choices. I, I hated multiple choice. For my for the life of me, I was terrible at it. If I guessed, it was always wrong. It's a matter of elimination, mostly. <laughs> All right, question nine. We're getting to the end. The character of Dracula was based on Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Vlad the Impaler, or Peter the Cruel. Wow, this is an easy one. Vlad the Impaler, my friend. There you go. And last question, and this is my favorite question. In the 1996 Tales from the Crypt movie, Bordello of Blood, (laughs) which actress has an uncredited cameo as hospital patient? Was it, remember it's 1996. Yeah. Was it Julia Roberts, Susan Sarandon, Gina Davis, or Whoopi Goldberg? I've got two top choices. I'm ne- it's either, to me, it's either Stan- Susan Sarandon or Whoopi Goldberg. You were correct. It's one of those two. I am going to probably make a mistake here, but I'm going to say Susan Sarandon. Ooh, it was Whoopi Goldberg. It was Whoopi. Mm, I should have known. How'd you do? What was your score? 7 out of 10. That's pretty good. Yeah, not too bad, actually. I think you're uh, um, a card-carrying uh, a vampire fan. Is there, like, a cool name for vampire fans? Um, Feels like there should be, right? Fanpires? Vampires, perfect nailed it yeah <laughs> that's why they pay me the big bucks uh, i mean as long as we're talking about uh, bram stoker's dracula mm-hmm. you may have read this yourself but i found this little piece of trivia on uh, susan harker the woman who uh, plays march in the show one of the leads yeah she is actually a descendant of jonathan harker a friend of bram stoker's who was immortalized in the book dracula oh interesting and so when they offered her the role, she was like, I have to. She's just like, I was born to play this. Birthright. <laughs> is there a birthright? Well, is there a blood one? So there's got to be some sort of blood pun there, right? Blood, blood right? Also, classic nepotism, am I right? Her great-great-grandfather. Like, give me a break. <laughs> this is what you're always railing against. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I know how you got the job. Your great-great-grandfather was in, in a vampire-related thing? Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall we get into episode three? Yeah, let's do it. Here's the IMD summary for Sub Judas. While investigating the attack on a woman who appears to have been saved from her attackers by an apparent vampire, Colefield and Angie find out the woman may be pregnant. The pregnancy appears to be at the direction of the vampires, and the team must determine why. And that, of course, was courtesy of Camus716. This episode has turned me, Luke. I have lost interest in Michael, and I am all Team Angela from this part this part forward really very interesting i didn't really like her so much as a character the first two episodes but now i'm like i'm getting behind her i am interested i want to see where this is where this is going i mean i'm not saying i'm a huge mike fan but i never expected a change to team angela (laughs) no one did no one did i've changed the jersey everything all right uh the episode begins with uh marion wainwright a, a barrister or as we know them a lawyer i think yeah She's uh, she's being menaced in a dark parking garage by a couple of thugs who I guess are, are there to mug her or something. It was like a casual mugging. She, you know, you know right away it's someone walking by themselves in a dark kind of spooky car parking lot or car park, I suppose. And the guy's just like leaning on the car and he's being all menacing. You're like, this is not going to go well. And then another guy comes. They start mugging her. I wasn't sure at first what happened because I thought maybe they did something. But she just faints. Yeah, she just faints dead away. And then we get a very violent scene, but somewhat off camera like we get that these two guys suddenly get attacked but it's off camera but all we see is the blood splat come out classic like uh like pg way of doing it yeah yeah their throats are ripped out but you don't get to see it but you still get to see the uh the viscera flying that's true that it was good viscera yeah (laughs) and then the guy who like saves her reaches into her purse and pulls out i guess like a personal protection like it's just like a personal alarm was that what it was have you seen one of those before? Like, yeah, it was like the size of a pen and he pushes it and alarm just goes off. And I'm just like, I don't think I've ever seen a personal protection device like that before. Yeah. Why didn't she just push it earlier? I think she fainted. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Classic fainting. Hey, uh, unrelated. You ever fainted? You know what? I don't think I have. I did one time in grade six. I fainted. Uh, autoerotic asphyxiation. It wasn't that. It was science class and I was holding my breath to impress some girls. Oh, did it work? <laughs> That old chestnut. Um, One, that doesn't impress any girls. And two, uh, no, it did not work. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, this guy really passes out easily. 
<laughs> yeah. What what a tough guy. Did you see the way he just fell and hit his head and gave himself a concussion? <laughs> But yes, this this is strange attack in this parking garage puts our, our vampire hunting team, or I'm going to attempt to call them Code Fives. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it, but I'm going to attempt to use the show's lore and call them Code Fives. Code Fives, sure. Our Code Five team is on the case now to figure out why a vampire... Damn it, I already fucked it up. <laughs> the Code Five team. Is already on the case to find why a Code Five would want to protect this lawyer. Right. And what they kind of find out about Marion is uh, she's sort of working on a fraud case she has a husband who is a courtroom reporter who uh, committed suicide uh and so he's dead now so she's got a whole bunch of weird background but none of it really adds up to anything like her husband killed himself after a series of failed pregnancy attempts and the fraud case she's working on doesn't seem to have anything to do with vampires in fact they go and like interview i guess i i co-counsel who's sort of working on the case that's right he says he's new to it because her previous co-counsel died in a car accident but um other than the like strange amount of deaths around here none of it seems to like none of it seems to make any sense to like there's no reason the vampire should be that interested in her and i did think of all the episodes up to this point they threw the most information at this in this episode at, at like i actually like this episode but at the beginning i was like i don't know this is a lot of intentional otherwise just sort of red herrings all over the place like this guy's dead and then this guy and i was like who who's she married to what happened yeah i it's a lot of it's a lot of uh there's a lot of information and i actually most of it does end up connecting in some way eventually but like yeah when i was taking to my notes i'm like trying to track so many dots but as they're looking into kind of her background they're they're like well it's strange her husband killed himself maybe we should have a quick look into him because that man who she was working on that that lawyer she's working with who also died in hit and run seemed to have been asking her out after her husband died and like as if maybe a jealous lover killed him and sure enough his grave is very empty <laughs> yeah they get a good scene of uh, michael goes to the grave and uh, while they're digging it up i don't know who's digging it up i guess they've just hired regular contractors who are like sure we'll do that and then you get to see that the uh the like the shot from down in the grave and up to him being like nothing in there <laughs> And, uh, you know, they've brought Marion in for questioning at headquarters, and she's not being entirely cooperative. And she's also getting a lot of nosebleeds and faintings during her interrogation. Yeah, because this is the point where you realize that the fainting is, is something. It's something more than just a one-off one-off faint, as it were. Because at the beginning, I thought, oh, it's just the shock of being mugged. But I'm like, oh, no, no, she she needs to have, like, a glass of orange juice or something. And they, they run some medical tests on her, and she, she appears to be pregnant, but upon an ultrasound, uh, they discover the gestation sac is empty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hate when that happens. Real vampire baby getting set up. I thought this was like, I'm like, oh, it's gonna be like Twilight, a little vampire baby's coming. And uh, I think it's gonna happen pretty soon. But they mentioned that, so she's pregnant, and she's had difficulties in the past keeping the babies, and they said she had 12 miscarriages. I don't mean to be insensitive, but like, that's too many miscarriages. Well, they sort of talk about it because they go to see her fertility clinic and they do talk about how it was a bit of an obsession for her. And they think that's what drove her husband to suicide, at least initially, is like she just wouldn't stop trying. And it was getting too much to bear, like all the disappointment the husband Mm -hmm. was giving her. In fact, I believe the uh, they go to talk to the fertility clinic because that's where they figure out she had this new pregnancy from. Like she'd been going there. She had her dead husband's sperm from when he was alive and they were doing treatments. And they were trying kind of one last attempt to get her pregnant with his sperm or as the uh, clinician at the clinic says uh his very low quality sperm <laughs> yeah that's right yeah they re- they re- they really rag on the dead guy's sperm in this so he's like it's like barely it's barely alive it doesn't even move it's the worst sperm i've ever seen it's barely sperm what i kind of found f- interesting about this whole fertility clinic thing is there's this like subcurrent that i don't remember and maybe just i was too young to notice it when it was going on but like there's a subcurrent in this episode about people are suspicious of fertility clinics like ivf is just like maybe a little unnatural like uh, angie march your favorite character she she seems a little off put by it the the guy who works the clinic says he has to lie at dinner parties because people give him strange looks when he says he like helps in vitro fertilization and i was just like there's a thing that did not stick around. I don't think there's any stigma to that these days, is there? Yeah, it was interesting that in, uh, I mean, in 20 years, I think there's a very different view of it, or at least it's it's become so much more commonplace um, that, yeah, it was a weird, a weird timestamp of like people being like, oh, what a weird invasion of science. And I was like, I don't know, seems, seems like it works. Yeah, it seems like nobody, uh, nobody cares anymore. Yeah. 
anyway, they uh, they get a they get a bit of his uh, sperm sample and they head back to the lab to like check it out. And it's a bit strange. They look through a microscope and they can definitely see the sperm cells, but if they expose it to sunlight, the sperm explodes. They're like something is funny here. Yeah, it seems like somehow the Code Fives have managed to like stick Code Five DNA into human sperm cells to cause it impregnation. But then it just raises more questions of just like, why would they bother? Like, why do they want to have kids? Like, what's the point? And, and what I like about this is this is a, um, a thread that's been going through all the episodes um, and will continue to go into the next episode as well, that these are very proactive vampires in this world. This is not your classic, they're just going around to feed off people. This is a proactive, well-organized group that is constantly trying to get think of new ways to survive new ways to reproduce new ways to fix problems like it's in every episode that's kind of what you learn is like this team every time they stop one thing the vampires are doing some something else and usually it's science-based yeah they're very driven by science like when they're talking about this potentially vampire pregnancy they're like it would be good they theorize because the, then the baby vampire could go out into the sunlight but it would be mortal, so it would kind of ruin the point of being a vampire. <laughs> like, it would just die of old age. Yeah, they were sort of guessing, like, is this the new thing the vampires want? Sort of the best of both worlds. You have all the benefits of a vampire, but you're not immortal, so you have... I actually am not quite sure. Like, are the vampires actually stronger or anything in this world? Have they shown that? It's been unclear. They certainly haven't shown them to be stronger, but they do seem to think there's some sort of threat, so hard to say i think hard to say right. uh so yeah there's a bit of an unknown about this whole pregnancy but either way half human half vampire looks like it's all it's all good <laughs> yeah that's uh not how father pierce feels about it because he immediately orders an abortion yeah that's right and he's uh he's in a bad mood and he's kind of in a bad mood for the next two episodes has he always been in such a a, a grumpy uh a grumpy sourpuss i don't know but he's definitely a sourpuss these next two episodes for sure and I was kind of just blown away by how quickly they're just like, all right, force an abortion on her. I was like, whoa, we're jumping right into it. <laughs> they uh, they actually try to convince Marion that she has a, fra- a phantom pregnancy. So there's nothing there. And like at some point, uh, Angela March offers to abort it for her. And Marion's just like, aren't you? I don't even think you're a cop. Like, I don't know who you are. <laughs> Why would I allow you to do that? There is a funny thing because this, for all intents and purposes, is mostly an Angela episode. She's the person who's driving uh, the story and who's really taken the lead on this case. But she's so aggressive about everything. Um, I think it's partially a personality and partially just this story. She's always pushing this woman. And this woman's always like, and who are you anyways? And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, you want to get rid of that vampire baby? Yeah, she's like a lawyer. And she's just like, I, I know you're not law enforcement. What are you doing to me? Yeah, <laughs> but they end up just taking her back to her fertility clinic where they do another ultrasound and the people she trusts there do tell her like, oh, there's no heartbeat. It's definitely a phantom pregnancy. And she's kind of like comes around to the idea of terminating the pregnancy. The lights go at the fertility clinic and uh, there's like a break in upstairs and like some security guard gets attacked with like liquid nitride aside. It's like some sort of like distractions happening. Well, see, <laughs> you know what I actually thought happened? I thought a vampire broke in and threw uh, a very cold, frozen sperm all over the guy. I thought that's what he attacked him with. <laughs> I mean, maybe. We don't know. Like, he was just in the lab. He's grabbing what he has. He's like, ah, take this on. And the guy's like, no. And, but then he, he was okay with it because he's like, this is really slow-moving sperm. It's barely even sperm. I don't mind it on my face. Very low quality. <laughs> very low quality. <laughs> it's kind of odd because, like, it's not like the vampire does anything either. Like, it basically just distracts uh march and mike and rice and like they kind of go off see what's going on and because march has been so aggressive about terminating this pregnancy even the like workers at the fertility clinic are off put like they're even just like whoa lady like why are you so aggressive because at some point angela's or sorry not angela but uh mary and the woman who's pregnant says oh hey i know you said it's a fan of pregnancy but i actually feel something moving in me like that's weird right like are we sure we're not worth reading and you know march is just insisting it's like nope you're you're mistaken so the fertility clinic doctors actually like help sneak her out while they're distracted because they're just like these guys are not on the level i don't know what's going on here but essentially marion's in the wind and they've lost track of the uh, of the vampire baby and let me just say at this point she's at least fainted like three four times she loves fainting she can't get enough of it. This is why she's had trouble 
caring to term. She clearly is not, it's not good for her. I think that's the idea is like pregnancies are very difficult on her. I was sure at one point you were going to find out she was, she was fainting so much because her body couldn't handle vampire baby. Well, I mean, that could, I guess that could be, they, they do imply when she says she feels it moving that there's no way it's that far along. Mm -hmm. Some indication of like an accelerated gestation, perhaps very, very much like Twilight. Oh, and uh, let me just mention real quick, and I do, I think it's around here when they, they discuss how she could be pregnant or not pregnant or uh, is something in her. And we do learn that the leeches slash vampires slash Code 5 or whatever they're called, uh, they say they're sterile, but then they make the point to say, but they can essentially have erections. Yeah, well, what's good as a vampire that can't have sex, Jordan? <laughs> yeah, I guess. But I just I just thought it was funny that like they're sterile. Like, but don't worry, like he could still get an erection. Like that's... You're just not going to get pregnant. Oh, yeah. He fucks, buddy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, now that they've lost Mary and they kind of make a last ditch effort where Father Pierce calls her cell phone and kind of tells her half of the truth. He kind of explains that, like, yes, she is pregnant, but like someone's been tampering with her husband's sperm sample and like she's not carrying her husband's child. Like she's being experimented on and then she really needs to think about terminating the pregnancy. And this, you know, Marion's freaked out, but she does listen and she kind of wants a second opinion so she kind of goes through a phone book and finds uh the natal care clinic it's kind of a rundown little clinic but she thinks it's off the beaten path she'll be safe there no one will know she's gone there and she heads there and uh what she finds though is this clinic's a bit of a trap but not from a code five i thought they set it up pretty well that she goes uh they're clearly are very concerned for her and they're trying to help her and talk about it and stuff but what becomes very clear is that this is a pro-life clinic that is going to try to talk her out of an abortion. Yeah, the the nurse turns out to have a cross on and is really like really giving her a guilt trip for even like considering her options. She's really trying to get her to keep the pregnancy. But the great irony of it is that cross the nurse is wearing has an adverse reaction on the code five fetus and causes her to miscarry right in the office. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it didn't go well for anybody. Oh, that poor pro-lifer just did it herself. And there's a lot of blood. At any rate, somehow, like, I guess they talked long enough that she knows a bit about her because the, the pro-life nurse is able to, like, get a hold of Marion's midwife who she'd hired to help her with the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And the team has basically managed to track her down through their own research because she's been missing. And, like, Angela March is there talking to her when the call comes in. They kind of discover that this midwife, she's been glamoured. She's got that, like, scar on her neck. So she's under the influence of vampires. And they essentially get word that Marion's on her way to a hospital. She's in the back of the ambulance. They're like, we need to intercept that ambulance before the vampire husband gets a hold of her. And there's sort of a, a race to this ambulance. And of course, the, the vampire husband gets there first. So uh, rest in peace, paramedics. <laughs> Nicely done. And I actually, I didn't know at first that it was her husband. I was just like, I, I was like, is it a random vampire? And also question, was it the husband that broke in and maybe threw the sperm all over everybody? I think we're not supposed to know. Like, there is a mystery to it. We don't know it's him until this scene because basically March manages to get to the, the ambulance after the husband gets there. He finds them in a nearby field. She's bleeding out. He's having a very emotional moment. Like, he explains that he only became a vampire to access the technology they have access to to hopefully impregnate her. Like, this for him wasn't about anything but giving her the baby she wanted. Yeah. And... He can't stand to lose her. Like, once again, it's gone badly. She's dying. And he's basically begging March to let him turn her into a vampire because he can't stand to lose his wife. And does she? No. Angela's cold-blooded. Yeah, she blows him away in the field. And then poor Marion ends up bleeding out and dying there as well. Which I thought, I mean, look, it's sad for this person. But I thought it was a great decision in terms of the show. It showed you... About Angela, I thought it was the appropriate ending to it. It's not, she didn't suddenly feel bad. She's just like, no, like this can't happen. And that's one for Team Humans. Well, and let's talk a little bit because we've skimmed basically over like the mechanics of the plot. But like this episode turned you into an Angela March fan. And it is because mm -hmm. like this whole story is like highlighting her backstory. And like we knew already that like her child and her husband had been turned into vampires and then they had been killed and turned to ash and put in the UV thing. 
So, you know, this is obviously about that. And we kind of learned her kid was five years old when it was turned into a vampire. So we're kind of seeing similarities between her story and this story. Like she had a husband, she had kids and she lost them to vampires. So she's like, she really sympathizes with Marion. Yeah, but not too much. (laughs) Well, that's true. But there's also, I believe it's the end of this episode, a real twist because like we're getting to learn her backstory about the death of her husband, the death of her child, or at least them turning to vampires and being dusted anyway. But it turns out her child was a twin. Yeah. So she has another kid. And I, I, I I was great. I didn't see that coming. I thought it was an interesting, interesting turn to have that. She's a single mom working on blood with vampires and has had two other vampire related deaths. What and yeah, one remaining twin. I was like, that's a that's a real grim turn of events. Why did only one twin get turned into a vampire? I thought this episode did a good job of establishing her as a character because she she was involved. She wasn't really a character on the periphery, but she hadn't really been the focus. And, and I thought it it was in the show's best interest to develop her character, which they did in this episode. And now, before we move on to episode four, I think we really need to quickly speak about our favorite C plot. What's Christy, that fiance, been up to? <laughs> oh, and let me mention, it's actually Kirsty, and we've been saying Christy, and I don't want to get an email of someone yelling at us. It's Kirsty. All right. I don't know the difference between those two. So. <laughs> you either got your Christy Swanson or your Kirsty Alley. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's how you always tell them different. Her story has been pr- is pretty minor this time. She, she can't find Jack, or not, sorry, Jack. That's her dead husband. Michael. She can't find Michael. After his apartment exploded because he's moved to not said where he's moved to. And he's also, as you mentioned, he really like old yellered her earlier where he's just yeah. like, go away and I never want to see you again. So she basically starts talking to a reporter asking him if he'll investigate her missing hu- her missing fiance and her missing good friend under these such weird circumstances. And so she basically hires a reporter to kind of look into this mystery. Um, and that's sort of all that really happens with her. Um, the only other thing of note is they meet at the Fat Boys Cafe. <laughs> I didn't notice that. Is that what it was called? Yeah, I was just like, oh, do you think the, the rapper started a cafe in London? Uh, I think it's more about how delicious the food is that you're going to leave as a fat boy and you're fine with it. Great. But yes, I didn't want to leave that out. I know people are wondering what kirsty has been up to. <laughs> yeah, kirsty as in kirsty Alley. All right, let's move on. Here is the IMDb summary for episode four, Mia Culpa. There's two ways of looking at this. One, we've got a boy, he's abused. Yep, by a priest. It gets too much, he pulls a knife. The other guys hear about it. Understandably, they show a post-traumatic reaction. Are you with me so far? Thank you. Option two, we've got what? Nothing. Has Andy found any marks on those boys? No, but in my opinion, they are infected. Well, how if they haven't been bitten? That is the question. After a boy kills a priest in school, the team investigates what led up to the attack and why some of them appear to be infected without having been bitten. The investigation leads them into the world of pedophiles. (laughs) It's still funny. Now, that's very accurate. It's exactly what happens this episode, and it is very odd that we have a mix of vampires and pedophiles. Sorry, there's still one more sentence to the synopsis. Oh, I'm sorry. Meanwhile, Christy continues to try to find Coalfield. (laughs) That's true. Uh, That was courtesy of Camus716. It's all vampires, all pedophiles. All, all the time. time. <laughs> um, yeah, so this does start off with this uh, Catholic schoolboy, Gary, who I think is a 10-year-old. Yeah, he's, he's probably about that, yeah. Yeah, uh, Gary's at school. At some point had wanted to be a priest, but he seems to be a little uh, distracted from his previous ventures into priesthood. And when his, uh, I guess, teacher, the priest who works there, kind of comes to talk to him about why he's been feeling so bad, uh, Gary pulls out a retractable razor and stabs the man to death. Yeah, and it, it, it happens really fast. And you're summarizing things, but you don't really know at this point uh, what their relationship is or what they're doing. But yes, he's studying to be a priest. So you assume they have a close relationship with this mentor figure. But he and, and you don't just stab him. He stabs him many, many times because oh, yeah. you only you see you see the result of it. And then later you'll see um, when they're doing an autopsy, like he's been stabbed like 10 times. Yeah, it was a pretty brutal stabbing. And I am going to really summarize a lot of this stuff because it takes a while to get into all. But I'm going to go through it all now because he goes missing after the stabbing. And they and obviously our, our code five team comes in to look into it and what they discover is all the other boys at the school seem to have like an aversion to light and uh, they, they don't like the Bible anymore. So uh, they're kind of suspicious that there's some sort of code five 
outbreak at this school, but none of them have any signs of infection, like, you know, typical like bites or anything that would show up like they usually look for. So they kind of put the entire school into quarantine and we kind of get our core, I don't know, it's like our sub dilemma of the episode is the team all is just like, this is clearly code five related. But Mike's just like, eh, could it just be meningitis? And Mike is really fighting them on the idea that there's any code five relation here. I don't know if it's just he was just annoying me or it's just that I didn't buy that he was so against the idea that it could have been vampires. Where it's like, it seems like everything is vampires. So just kind of like he's, I guess my point is you've joined the team. It's team vampire. You're, you're, you're looking for vampires. And he seems to be like, he's really scullying it up. Yeah, I mean, he really, I think the idea is he's trying to show an alternate point of view, but his reasoning for it sometimes is a little, is weaker than it should be. And he's a little bit petulant, isn't he? Yeah, he seemed to be in a bad mood this episode. I think maybe his character is just having a bad day. <laughs> he's just having a bad day. Yeah, but, and I think this is part of me switching off him. I was like, you're starting to annoy me now, Michael. Anyway, uh, young Gary on the run for the murder of this priest, he, he heads to a local park and goes into the public toilets to have a good cry. And... Bumps into a very creepy dude. Yeah, at this point, it's funny because what what you find is this guy finds him and takes him home. And they sort of play it kind of right down the line that you don't know what's happening. But I was like, geez, this is creepy. Like, this guy seems like he's a pedophile. And I didn't realize that's what this episode was about. But uh, spoiler, he's a pedophile. Very quickly, once he gets Gary back to his place, he's just like, yeah, go check out my computer. I've got the latest Star Wars game on there. Not even in the arcades yet. You want a beer? Yeah, I loved it. Now, Luke, would that have worked on you? I mean, absolutely. I would have uh, been molested immediately. (laughs) It is, like, the perfect level of creepy. It's the perfect level of just like, oh, this isn't right. And then every new thing he says, you're just like, oh, yeah, okay, I see exactly where this is going, and I do not like it. Yeah, yeah, it it, it was well done. And I actually even thought um, what the guy's apartment looked like. It was clearly like... A single guy who is not that interested in um, anything other than uh, having a good setup for little kids. And he's got this dog, which uh, he claims normally is very friendly. But when this dog sees Gary, the dog loses his mind. And like, while he's going to get Gary a soda from the kitchen, the, the dog attacks Gary in a brutal fashion. <laughs> yeah, it and it yeah, it doesn't. It, it like mauls him. It's It's quite the dog attack. And Gary... Has no choice. He grabs the kid, drags him to a hospital, and does that classic, like, uh, ditch him at the hospital thing. He, like, drops him off with the doctor, and the doctor's like, what happened? He's like, a dog attacked him. And he's just like, gotta go. See you later. No, what, what he actually says is he drops he drops him up. They're like, it was a dog attack. And then and the doctor's like, okay. And then he runs away. He's like, he's like, he's usually pretty good. It was like something like that. <laughs> it was like he, he wanted to just let everyone know that this is not a normal thing he does. It's not the dog's fault. Yeah. Clearly Gary's fault. It's clearly Gary's fault. And then what's great, too, is we see this, like, creepy guy go home. He, like, has a shelf with dozens of unmarked VHS tapes. Like, that kind of thing that gives you that sickening feeling in your stomach. And he's just, like, tossing them in a bag, going off to a a dump. And he's just burning all these VHS tapes. And you're just like, oh, man, there's nothing good in this VHS tape. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's not like when I found uh, an old VHS that my dad had uh, been recording on. And what it was was just a weird view into my dad's brain it was just like uh, a nature show and there was a clip of david letterman and then there was one clip of twin uh midget real estate agents so your dad would just hit record anytime he saw something that like tickled his fancy for like 30 seconds yeah i I think it was just like that's weird record that's weird record and so it was just this weird uh, vhs i found once of just really odd random things but uh i wouldn't burn that if you still had that man that's internet gold people would love it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> probably, probably. Anyway, uh, because Mike has been so skeptical that the Code Fives are involved in all this, he uh, he basically starts his own side investigation into whether this dead priest was a pedophile. He's very suspicious that this dead priest was probably a pedophile. And I actually liked how they did. Like they're they're going for it because it seems like that that makes sense based on you know obviously what we've known about what's happened with the Catholic Church and. And just what we're used to, the idea that uh, that is now synonymous with with priests. But there isn't a lot of evidence for it is really the problem. Yeah. And 
it's interesting because he like looks into it. He kind of finds out that, you know, obviously Gary and the priest are pretty close. They had a mentor mentee relationship. He finds out the two of them worked with a local boys soccer team and they go and like Mike goes and interviews the soccer coach who kind of knew them both, which I enjoyed because the soccer coach gets very indignant. He's just like, oh, so because I work with children, I have to be some sort of pervert. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And then they're like, they're like, but the priest, he's like, yeah, he's not a pervert either. And they're like, yeah, but and he's like, no perverts. We're all normal. Unfortunately for that dead priest, though, Mike goes back and searches his study and finds an old floppy disk hidden in one of his cabinets. And on that disk are very ominous video stills from uh, Gary sleeping in a strange bed. I think it's here. I don't know if it's here. It's a couple scenes later where, where Michael's basically like, look, I'm right. And and Pierce, and I don't know if it's because Pierce is a uh, priest, but he really pushes hard against all the other possible reasons why this guy would have this floppy disk. It is weird because that's what happens is like Mike kind of finds really good evidence that should be considered. But I think because Pierce knew the priest, he's a little hesitant. And even like the rest of the team seems like not quite to buy it because he's using every season book to be like, oh, we don't know. We don't know the priest had that for nefarious reasons. Like he I think at some point he says something like the metadata doesn't show that the priest downloaded it on one of his computers could have got it somewhere else. And I'm just like, how does that exonerate him? (laughs) I know it's like it's like sure you have the murder weapon it's in your house it's like but maybe someone gave it to you maybe it wasn't the murder weapon it's like well, it doesn't look good it doesn't, it doesn't look great for you you also never mentioned it to anyone yeah at any rate Mike and Rice they go check out the park where uh, Gary was seen before he uh, went to that creep's house and as they're sort of poking around they happen to notice that public toilet he was in seems to be a lot of men coming and going uh, and I think at some point they call the men leaving the bathroom clearly pedophiles. <laughs> not just someone who's using a public washroom and i was just like hey, you guys uh this is uh, this is not great detective work <laughs> again isn't it crazy though that in this vampire show it's just all pedophiles oh yeah they're really digging into it for sure and kind of this leads them to like pull police records for like i guess people with who the police have looked into for sexual offenses in the area and that list leads them to the our old creepy our old creepy friend's house who uh was once questioned by the cops but never charged with anything though they happen to know that he's made a couple trips to thailand so you know what that means <laughs> yeah it's not that he loves thai food um and obviously the creepy guy is initially fairly uncooperative perhaps because he's burned all the evidence in his home but you know in true Idris Elba fashion, Rice uh, starts slapping him around like a like a bad detective and and threatening his dog. They go into a uh, bad cop, good cop, like right away. And honestly, if I was someone being uh, interrogated by them, I'm like, guys, like I know exactly what you're doing. One of you is nice, one of you is mean. What's kind of weird too is Mike, who's been really on the hunt for at anything that's not Code Five related. He gets really uncomfortable with the use of force here, even though up to this point, it seems like he's been pretty gun ho about it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just the uh, the look of another man getting slapped. I don't know. Anyway, this guy comes clean. He kind of talks about how those VHS tapes he had were actually of the boys soccer team the priest helped coach. But he had never met the priest before and kind of is just like, I don't think the priest was part of the ring, the circles I run in. I used to get those tapes from this guy with a skin condition who really hated the sunlight a guy named oliver maybe you should go talk to him doesn't sound good skin condition sunlight what are you thinking you're thinking pedophile vampire exactly this is where you're headed so uh, they head over to old oliver's place at night which i was just like you know he's not gonna be home it's nighttime <laughs> <laughs> they bust in they find a hidden camera pointed at the bed that's the same one that Gary was in in those pictures. They find lots more VHS tapes laying around. You know there's nothing good going on in this this apartment. I knew nothing good was going on based on the bedspread and the curtains that they put up. Yeah, it's it a real creep fest in there. Yeah, you just you just look and you're like, oh, this is this is not good. There's nothing good here. And as they're looking around... Oliver returns home accompanied by a, a very young boy and he, he sort of heads into the bedroom with this boy and he hasn't noticed that Mike and Rice are there because Mike's sitting in the bedroom or not the bedrooms they're sitting in a separate room looking at the sort of VHS camera like they're looking at what, what basically Mike thinks is a feed from inside the bedroom. Yeah he thinks it's a live feed that Rice is watching but what we find very quickly is Rice is watching a videotape and so you get this pretty well done scene where 
Michael is watching the older gentleman and the kid in a room together, and he keeps looking at the videotape, so, and he doesn't see anybody there, so he's assuming vampire. So he kicks open the door and starts shooting and kills the guy. Well, he doesn't kill him. He shoots him in the stomach and basically knocks him in the bed. That's true. He doesn't kill him. You're right. And the guy's like screaming and writhing around. And then he looks back at the videotape that or the, the screen that uh, Rice is watching in the room. And Rice has turned it back to the live feed. And he's just like, oh, shit. Uh, this guy's a human being that I just shot in the stomach. And uh, that little boy he's with, that little boy has no image. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, a big mistake. You shot the human, missed the vampire boy. Uh, I do like, before the little vampire boy runs off, he uh, reaches down and, like, scoops a little blood out of the bullet wound and has a little taste and is like, yummy, see ya! And they basically, like, lose that vampire boy immediately. He just, like, scurries out the door. I mean, if you're a vampire, you gotta have a taste. And it is kind of funny here because... Mike feels really bad about shooting this man in the stomach. Um, And, you know, maybe that's fair. Like, you don't want to shoot a human being. But he was fine shooting him when he thought he was a pedophile vampire, but less fine when he thinks he's a pedophile human being. That's that's the line he draws. (laughs) Like, he was so gung-ho before, but this is the thing that causes him to be crazy. Anyway, they've got this guy. They bring him in to treat him for the bullet wound in his stomach and... uh, rice really questions if mike's cut out for this work because he's just like you thought he was a vampire and you didn't even take a kill shot i actually thought that was a really good character moment for rice which was he was angry not because michael screwed up but he screwed up in a different way which is he didn't kill if it was a vampire he wouldn't have killed him and i was like that's great what a great line of dialogue so he's being tested the team's actually also found gary at this hospital so they're giving gary tests as well for they're doing a spinal tap to see if he has meningitis and they're like bringing father pierce in to see if uh he hates priests yeah yeah that was a funny thing he's just like what do you think of me (laughs) and it kind of turns out now they have both of these people in this case that everybody was correct about what was going on yeah we basically find out that skin guy who has a, a, a some sort of immune deficiency for the sun, uh, has been kind of being used as an incubator for this vampire virus. So he's basically patient zero. Yeah, basically the vampires were experimenting with biological warfare and gave the man with the skin condition a strain of meningitis that also spread code 5, like also turns you into a vampire? Yeah. It's both meningitis and vampirism. They're doing it on him because he can't go in the sun, so they figure, hey, good test subject because he's not going to like hurt the disease by walking around in sunlight and they basically made a deal with old oliver that like hey you be our guinea pig and we're gonna give you a forever boy and the forever boy is while he looks like a 10 year old he's actually a 200 year old man (laughs) so it is one of those things where you get what you wish for but it's not quite what you wanted and as a result oliver kind of is it into it i guess so he immediately goes back to stalking little boys yeah i mean like we have to say and it hasn't been said at point this whole episode feels very unsettling and creepy it's a it's a crazy episode so that's kind of what led him to i guess oliver met gary out on the soccer field and he accidentally spread the men like he basically broke quarantine gave the meningitis to poor gary Fucking Gary had a tough time, man. Yeah, he really did. Gary brought it back to school, infected the whole school. And anyway, case closed. They figured it out. And they're able to cure everybody? Question mark? Yeah, they kind of just let that dangle a little bit. It did seem like we they cured the kids and didn't have to put them all down. But I was just like, oh, I thought it would be more in character for the show. If they put all the kids down, that would have been more in character for the show. Yeah, can you imagine they're like, uh, worst meningitis outbreak, it killed everybody. So there we go. Just a headline that says meningitis outbreak kills all school. You just have a shot of all the, the kids' bodies in a big pile and, and uh, Angela's taking lighter fluid to them. <laughs> Mike's pulling on his collar being like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's pretty much it. But I think, I'm sure you have notes. There are two other plot lines that are happening uh, in this show. I do, I do have, I say, I do have notes there of the two side stories that we need to talk about that happened mm-hmm. kind of underneath this story. And the first has to do with Father Pyrrhus. Do you want to get into that? Pyrrhus? Do you want to get into that? They've actually seeded this pretty well. For a couple episodes, you've seen that he hasn't really uh, felt well and he's had some tests done and they've had him not being able to sleep at night. And uh, what you kind of find out is he's been doing sort of separate tests with Angela 
and the results have come back and we find out that he has a uh, positive cancer uh, results for his test. So it's a, um, I believe it's a, it's an untreatable cancer, correct? Yeah, it's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that he has, which as they note from research that's been done on it, it's triggered by sunlight. Oh, the irony for a vampire hunter. Yeah, and then he has he has the line. He's like he's like the sun. It it, it gives and taketh away, or something like that. And I was like, all right, <laughs> sure. But yeah, so we kind of are revealing here that Doctor Pierce, or Doctor Pierce, Father Pierce, our our sort of head of the team, is now dying of cancer. So that's probably going to weigh heavily over the next few episodes, and and maybe explains his bad mood. And so, do you think they're playing with the idea that he's trying to get a lot accomplished before he dies, and that's why he's like he is as driven as he is? I think so. I think that explains sort of his aggressiveness, why he's so aggressive in the last episode, why he's so aggressive even with Gary the child when he really forces like the tests on him, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, we can't wrap this episode uh, without talking about Christy, the ex-fiance's wacky adventures. Kirsty. Sorry, Kirsty's wacky adventures. (laughs) (laughs) Are they wacky? So, So last time we saw her, she'd hired a reporter to look into her problem. And we actually mostly see things going on with the reporter this episode. Mm -hmm. He's like going to the library. He's looking at microfiche. He's doing it all. It's a real conspiracy episode. By the way, is there anything more exciting than and in a TV show than having someone look at microfiche? You know they're getting work done. It reminded me how that was such a thing for so long. The idea, like through the seventies and eighties, looking at microfiche was looking at stuff, and. I never personally saw microfiche till I was at university and there was still like some small archive of microfiche. And I remember going to the library once and just taking out some random microfiche so I could go look at it in one of those scr- in one of those like viewers just because I'm like, what? Uh, I've always seen microfiche. I want to see how they work. After you were looking at the microfiche, did you solve any crimes? I solved all the crimes. <laughs> all of them. Oh, well, well done. I remember that that year. That was 2001 where all the crimes were solved. Yeah. Remember when all the crimes got solved? That was me. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, he's uh, we follow him in his sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, it's the short form for his investigation. But we get a weird scene where he's walking home at night. And I guess he feels like he's being followed or watched. And he sort of just stops and he's like, you can come on out like I know you're there. And we get this very ominous, creepy guy quite a ways away, kind of steps out from the shadows. And they kind of like stare at each other. And you're like, well, that that's not good. I'm assuming vampires or pedophile. <laughs> well, I thought it could be the agency too, the Code Five agency. Maybe was on to him, but yeah, definitely the idea that someone's stalking him, and he's been telling like Chris Kirsty not to call on her landline. Like people are listening in on us, so really building attention to this conspiracy. And he kind of disappears on Kirsty, not answering her calls, and then peers back at her house one night, and they like have dinner together, and he kind of explains like, "Sorry, I went like." underground for a bit there like we're really getting de- in deep here like whatever we're looking into is like some really sinister government organization and uh then he's just like by the way have you noticed how we have hard-ons for each other <laughs> there's a couple things that happen he comes over and he's like sorry i missed our lunch she's like that's okay i cook dinner for you because she doesn't have a lot of confidence so they have dinner he doesn't seem to like it she points out that he doesn't like it he goes to the bathroom throws it all up you're like uh-oh warning bell one and then he starts hitting on her he kisses her and she's like we shouldn't and then he's like all right and then she's like no we should and then it ends with not only them kissing but he goes for her neck and you're like is he kissing her neck or is he biting her neck because i think he is a gdv (laughs) but yeah i mean that's basically the the plot line here is we're like christy's in trouble the vampires are here yeah so I'm, I'm assuming that guy was a vampire, turned to a vampire. Now he's a vampire. He ain't helping her. Yeah, the, it's, it, things are going bad for Mike on the uh, Kirsty side. Oh, and, and I had to say, my note was for Kirsty, man, she has terrible luck with men. She truly does, doesn't she? Real bad luck. If he's a vampire, which they're clearly alluding to, this is two vampires she will have been in a relationship with. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And then one vampire hunter she has a, a crush on. Yeah, and if you ask me, that's two vampires too many. All right, Jordan. Well, that's kind of the end of these two episodes. Do you have any final notes you want to talk about? Or should we get right into the ratings? Well, I have one thing, and I'm going to ask you, because you're usually a little better at this than I am. There's one person we haven't talked about, and I don't think we've actually talked about this character for several episodes, and it's the character of Francis. And Francis sort of shows up 
for a scene or two every episode and to talk to Michael. I don't really get her point in the show or what she's trying to do or what her purpose in the show or the purpose in the world. Do you feel get the same feeling? I every time I do my notes, I always make notes that Francis, who is Mike's ex-girlfriend, is in every episode. But ultimately, you don't really need to know much about her. She's apparently she's some sort of secret agent. She's some sort of like MI5 agent. So she kind of knows the world of espionage. And that's why Mike talk. He's basically she's someone for Mike to go talk to to complain about how hard it is to work for a secret governor government organization. And then occasionally, like Christy, will track her down and is like, "Where's Mike?" And she's like, "I'm not telling you." So she's just there, but there really hasn't been much reason to talk about her. Yeah. So I don't know if she's going to become something more, or it's just she's just a expository element like she she right now is working like a diary like the scene could very well be him writing in voiceover what happened or him just talking out loud because she's she has added pretty much nothing to the show but it's just weird that they always have her come back and she just like shows up she's like hey remember me and it's like oh where francis is back yeah absolutely i mean i'm glad you brought it up because every every time we talk like the last two episodes we talked about like we've done four episodes now and every time i'm just like I guess we could mention her, but I'm like, I don't know what we're going to say. <laughs> and I have one other note, and that is, if you're an actor, getting cast as a pedophile must be the worst thing. I mean, work's work, buddy. I mean, it's work, but <laughs> Ugh. No, no, you know what? The only thing worse than getting cast as a pedophile once? <laughs> <laughs> Twice. <laughs> That's right. I mean... That means you got a real pedophile face. It'd be real tough to get typecast as that. I think it would make your life difficult. <laughs> the agent calls like, okay, good news and bad news. <laughs> We got more work for you, but it's another pedophile role. We, we finally got you a lead in the movie, but you're not going to like the movie. <laughs> yeah. It's called A Boy's Life. It's not what you think. Oh, man. That's grim. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you want to rate these things? Yeah. Um, I just want to say, as we go into the ratings for these, I noticed something about these two episodes that, like, I really like. Mm-hmm. But in a just for, like, probably... For just weird reasons, these are really felt like ripped from the headlines storylines. Pedophile rings and uh, pregnancies being done by IVF clinics. Like it felt like these were like ripped from like the headlines of the day kind of thing. They felt to me very much like Law and Order SVU episodes. I agree. You know what I actually thought? My note was these feel very much like a show we did previously, which is Threshold, except I think they're executing this in a way that works in a way that threshold didn't and and, and, now they're different shows but i think they're going for the same sort of idea which is what's happening right now there's this new technology we've heard about let's put this into the show and incorporate it and i think for whatever reason it's working better with vampires than it is for aliens i think you're right i also made a note about that like i think the hiding the overall conspiracy and forcing our agents to dig into it and we only get elements of it is very threshold i i think the actual like plot mechanics felt like svu to me because it's just like overly dark subject matter like very grim stuff but then it's like filtered through that really pulpy procedural lens so yeah it's both entirely inappropriate vaguely stupid at times but this is what i i I don't watch a lot of svu but anytime i watch an episode i always find it so darkly funny how inappropriately insensitive it is like how much it wants to like present these things but also wants to like really capitalize on the shock value of these things it's this weird mix that i think some people are probably and probably should be really turned off of but like i always find how grimly opportunistic these shows are to be like deeply entertaining how dumb and like awful they are i get your point and especially with the pedophile thing i mean like look how many times we've had to say the word pedophile like it's it's a horrible horrible topic and uh, issue but it's just like hey that's a thing it's a uh, it gets us into this episode and they walk that line pretty well like i think they execute it well like you never feel like they're being uh, uh flippant with it it's like it just happens to be the plot line for these vampires well that's the thing it's like i agree that they don't feel like they're being flippant with it but there's also just something just like this is a dumb vampire show so it's also just like kind of insensitive in them just even handling the material which for me, there's just something like weird. It's so weird and such a hard line to walk. And it just like kind of makes me laugh watching them try to like be so topical and so 
and just so like hardcore while also just being like kind of a silly vampire show i, I agree but, but again I'll, I'll say i think they're doing a, a good job and i think the execution is working at least for me i don't disagree i because i'll tell you what i'm gonna give that first episode sub judas the one about the f- fake pregnancy it's a 7.5 for me because like i was entertained the whole time luke i think so far this show is one of the top shows for you and i having similar feelings i'm also going to give it a seven and a half actually at first i wasn't going to give it that high but as this episode went on and i was like yeah angelo's angelo's pretty cool 7.5 and then for mia culpa the even the even more problematic episode i i'm still sticking with a 7.5 like i don't think this show is for everyone but i think there's just a certain certain viewers will find it deeply entertaining like it's just like you can't look away i agree also a 7.5 i think they're just that fraction of a ways away from having it be great like it's like it's entertaining and it's good and it's fun and you're right sometimes it's stupid and sometimes it's a little salacious but i don't know what it is yet but i keep hoping there's gonna be an episode that just knocks it out of the park they they haven't quite got there but they're i think they're pretty close yeah i mean i i like i totally agree with 7.5 on these like i i, I love that we're on the same page about that I feel like the show is incapable of cracking any higher. I think this is like, it's just like, it's good. Like it's a fun watch, but I just don't know if like, it can't be all of these things and also be like really, really smart. I don't think. Well, we'll see. I mean, we have two more episodes, so we're going to see uh, at the end of the miniseries if they've, uh, if they knock it out of the park. But so far, I mean, this it's a very consistent miniseries. That's for sure. That's for sure. I like that they call it a miniseries, too. It's just like, I'm like, I guess six episodes, but I, I have sure. a feeling it's never going to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Anyway, that wraps it up for this episode. If uh, you have thoughts on our uh, on the show we're watching, <laughs> what's it called? Ultraviolet. I was going to say Continuum Drag. <laughs> you can email us at continuumdrag at gmail.com. And of course, on Twitter and Instagram, we're going to put up some clips from the show. Uh, I mean, we're going to have to tread pretty carefully. I don't want to put too yeah. much pedophile I mean, stuff up. I mean, my notes right now, it's like, I don't know, what am I going to pull? Pedophilia? Like, <laughs> Yeah, let's try to dodge as much of that as we can. Yeah. But we'll find something to put up anyway. Really lean heavily into the first episode. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, but listener, thank you for joining us on this very strange journey into these two episodes. And Jordan, see you next week. See you then. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rex Seedler. Produced by Jordan Dulloch and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Hughes.